been discussing they've been uh, discussing the current position of the subject in schools. And one aspect that was discussed was the role of uh, geography, sorry, the role of field work um, in schools. And we're going to be looking at uh, that this evening. In addition to it being raised by Ofsted, fieldwork is also a common focus of questions at the last Jog Live webinar. So it is something that people do want to have that, that content on. So as I said this evening, we are focusing on fieldwork and place knowledge, and we're thrilled to have a range of talks about that. Uh, Anthony, could you put the next slide, please? So as you can see, this is the plan for this evening. We're aiming to finish at about six o'clock. Uh, as you can see from our schedule, Julia Tanner is going to be giving an overview on fieldwork. Anthony Barlow is going to be talking about approaches to developing place knowledge. And Jen Lomas and Sophie Bright will be discussing case studies and examples from their schools. We've got a number of committee members here tonight and we're going to be answering your questions later on. So please do add any queries that you have um, that come up during the talks to the chat. Uh, we've also got our Twitter, so if you want to post any thoughts on that with the hashtag JogLive, that'd be really good as well. Okay, next slide, please, Anthony. So just before we start, we'd like to remind you of some of the publications that you might find supported in your geography planning and teaching. So the Geographical Association produces a professional journal, Primary Geography, three times a year, and that covers a, a range of themes. Subscription to the Geographical Association gives you online access at geography.org.uk to past editions, and it also gives you the three annually, annually produced editions which are posted out. Uh, next slide, please. So other benefits to the Geographical Association membership includes discounts off publications, such as those you can see on the screen at the moment, uh, which gives you further support, subject information and support with leading geography. And you're also able to access a wide range of online content through subscription as well. Uh, next slide, please. We'd also like to let you know that Leading Primary Geography, which is one of the most recently published texts on primary geography, is now available via the Geographical Association online, online shop. Okay, uh, first of all, I'm going to pass to Julia Tanner. So, Julia, over to you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. It's lovely to uh, know so many of you are here joining us today. Um, uh, as you know, uh, our focus tonight is fieldwork. Um, so I thought I'd remind you before we uh, move on to look at uh, fieldwork and where it sits in the primary national curriculum, um, that we are having a national fieldwork week next June. This is being organised by next year's president, uh, Alan Parkinson. Uh, next year's president of the Geographical Association and it will be an opportunity we hope for every school in the land to be involved in taking part in fieldwork activities either within their school grounds or further afield. There'll be a lot more information about that coming uh, from September onwards. And two other Geographical Association uh, publications I thought you might be interested in because they're particularly relevant to today. These are two very recent uh, CPD packs that the Geographical Association has produced. Uh, these are packs that um, are downloadable and they're intended to support subject leaders in providing um, subject specific CPD for their colleagues in school. Um, they contain sets of activities that can be done either in, in an emergency, 15 minutes, uh, in an hour or in a half day, if you were lucky enough to have a half day. So the first one has been written by Paula Owens and it's uh, looking at field work, how and why do field work. And then the second one uh, is written by myself and that one's called progression in field work experiences. And that's looking particularly at how we build progression into the curriculum from the early years through to the end of key stage two. Okay, could we have the next slide please, Anthony? So I've started with a quote from uh, Ian Friedland's recent publication. Ian is, of course, the HMI, lead HMI for geography. Um, and his recent uh, blog about geography in outstanding primary schools contains the sentence, fieldwork is vital to geographical practice. And of course, uh, that theme is much extended in the very recent research report on um, research into geographical education that was published a couple of weeks ago. So the first question really is, why do we do fieldwork at all? Well, fieldwork is memorable 
And through memorable real life learning, children build up the knowledge that they need that can help them to understand the processes which shape our environment. And this is a point made uh, at some length by Ian in the recent research um, review. Uh, also, of course, fieldwork involves doing geography, it's active, and it helps children understand what might otherwise be quite abstract concepts, such as scale or settlement, uh, through learning about concrete examples. Another uh, very important reason for doing fieldwork is that it empowers children through authentic learning activities. Uh, there are many, many ways in which children can take part in real inquiries which have real purposes, real outcomes, real audiences. Um, and this is very empowering for children as young citizens able to act in the real life world. And of course, it's an opportunity to learn and practice and apply all those geographical skills, fieldwork, skills, map work skills, data handling skills, analysing visual data and so on. And as Ian points out in his blog, it's fun. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm going to be speaking about a couple of um, key points in a recent article I published about progression in geographical um, fieldwork experiences. And this diagram is part of that. Um, so this shows two dimensions of fieldwork experiences that we would hope all children get a chance to have while they're in primary schools. So uh, on the vertical axis there, you've got some fieldwork experiences might be pupil led, others might be teacher led. And across the bottom, you've got some fieldwork experiences might be about measuring and quantifying something like a traffic flow, perhaps, uh, or on the right hand side, they might be much more about people's emotional response or engagement with a place. And I know that in the examples that Jen and Sophie are going to give from their schools later on, you're going to see examples of uh, things from across uh, these two spectra. Next slide, please, Anthony. Thank you. So uh, one of the points made very strongly indeed in the uh, research review of geography is that inquiry based field work enables children to build knowledge, knowledge of location and knowledge of place and makes the learning real for them. So this is um, and this is a, an extended uh, description of what inquiry led field work involves. It starts with not only asking questions, but also deciding on how to answer them. And then from that, moving on to planning the field work. And then of course, actually collecting the field data. This might, observe, might include observing things, describing them, measuring, identifying, classifying, naming them. And it nearly always involves recording the data, perhaps on a base map, or completing a survey by taking photographs or a sound recording, completing a data collection sheet. Uh, I'm going to come on to the many different fieldwork techniques in a moment. And uh, as uh, Ian Friedland points out very strongly, uh, there is no point in collecting field data unless you're going to do something with it to answer the questions that you were asking in the first place. So presenting and analyzing the data is the next stage. And then finally, of course, everything makes sense if children know from the outset that they are going to have a real audience that they are going to communicate the results of their inquiry to. So next slide please. So uh, this is the inquiry cycle in geography. The original of this is uh, Paula Owen's work. I know Paula has joined us today. Thank you, Paula, as ever, for this. And uh, it, it also draws on the work of Margaret Roberts, who might not be so familiar to uh, the audience that we have with us today. But Margaret uh, Roberts is a, a very, very significant name in secondary geography and, uh, and has written several books on the inquiry approach in geography for secondary teachers and pupils. One of Margaret's uh, very important points is that we need to create what she calls a genuine need to know so that uh, field work should involve children asking a real question for which they can find out a real audience, uh, for which they can find out a real answer and communicate that to a real audience, whether that's uh, maybe the governor, governing body, uh, the local uh, authority, um, the local police, if it's about a, a crime issue, it could be all sorts of things. And then as you can see on the right hand side here, we've got the inquiry process, starting from asking questions, 
moving forward to deciding how you're going to uh, collect your data, actually collecting your data, reflecting on what you found out, that's the analyzing and presenting, communicating it to somebody else, and finally evaluating both what has been learned and the process by which uh, that learning has taken place. And I know that uh, when we get to Sophie's uh, input uh, later on, she is going to be talking about using this process, this diagram with her year six class, giving us two case uh, examples. Next slide, please. OK, so I said I'd come back to fieldwork techniques. Uh, I'm the co-author of uh, the Everyday Guide to Primary Geography Local Fieldwork. That's the front cover of it there uh, with uh, my great friend and colleague, Jane Whittle. Um, and this is page nine from that publication, which lists, as you can see, I know you can't see the detail, but it lists on the uh, on the left hand side there uh, the, many of the ways in which we collect data uh, through fieldwork in geography. Um, so I know you can't see it, but just to give you a feel for it, the first one, of course, is observing and discussing, looking and talking. And then uh, there is map reading, map making and recording on maps. So three to do with mapping. Uh, then there is using visual approaches. So uh, using aerial images, sketching, drawing, annotating and photography. Uh, sound recording, of course, is easy to do these days. And then uh, moving on towards the bottom uh, of that chart, we've got lots of examples um, of uh, using more quantitative approaches. So there's measuring, there's quantifying, there's data handling, there's making judgments, um, there's using interviews and questionnaires. And finally, at the bottom, uh, using transects. So these are all examples of the sorts of fieldwork techniques we would want all children to have at least one chance to experience uh, during their primary years. Next slide, please, Anthony. So um, the article I wrote recently for Primary Geography is in the last but one edition of uh, Primary Geography. It's called a Framework for Progression in Fieldwork Experiences. And uh, what I've tried to do with it, if we could have the next slide, please, Anthony. What I've tried to do, I can't show you the actual framework, it's much too detailed, but what we've tried to do um, for each of the four age ranges, um, three to five, five to seven, seven to nine, and nine to 11, to show the sorts of range of fieldwork experiences we want children of that age to have. And then uh, the fieldwork opportunities that arise in the curriculum for that age group, and then the techniques. So it's a much extended list of techniques organized in terms of uh, what pupils should do at different ages. So if I could just move on, thank you. Um, that the article is there. If you're a member of the GA, you can download it for free. If not, you can actually buy it, or of course you can join up and download it for free. Um, these are some other books that we wanted to bring to your attention. All of these books contain lots and lots of examples of fieldwork activities that you could pick up and do in your school. And many of them contain examples of uh, school-based um, projects or school-based uh, case studies that you might want to look at. So we'd like to recommend uh, all of these books to you. OK, uh, Anthony, can I hand on to you to talk about uh, understanding place through fieldwork? Thank you, Julia. And again, if you're just joining us, a warm welcome to you. It's really good to have you on board um, from the members of the Early Years and Primary Committee. So I'm Anthony Barlow. I work at the University of Roehampton in initial teacher education. You can see my Twitter handle there, and I'm the co-author of one of the books on the previous page, Mastering Primary Geography, published by Bloomsbury. What I want to start off, though, with is thinking about fieldwork and thinking about it through the lens of you and your experiences, because I want you to think about bringing your experiences to the classroom and celebrating those and reflecting on those, those formative experiences. And I'm going to read you something that was um, written at the weekend, published in the Financial Times, written by Michael Palin, and I owe a great debt of gratitude to Alan Parkinson, current president, or future president of the Geographical Association, for highlighting this. And this, I think, shows the power of telling a story about landscapes and reminding yourself of those formative experiences. Travelling is driven by curiosity. You could replace the word travelling there for geography. Geography is driven by curiosity. When I was growing up in Sheffield, I read avidly of the wider world, but thinking I would never see 
the real Wild West or the Great Lakes. I recreated them with the help of curiosity, imagination, and a bicycle and the Peak District. As COVID-19 shrunk my globe-trotting options, I've now realized how important those childhood bike rides were in creating an appetite for the wider world. Over these past months, I've rediscovered the pleasures of travel in miniature, the rhythms of natural and human life to be found each day within minutes of my home. Crossing and recrossing Hampstead Heath, where Michael Palin lives in London. It might sound repetitious, but repetition has taught me that nothing is ever the same compared to the last time. Now as we near high summer, the ponds in front of Kenwood House are brimming with ducks, geese, moorhens and coots fighting for space in which to bring up their families. In the depths of winter, I get equal pressure from a robin skittering about in dead leaves. Travelling geography is not just about ticking boxes and moving on. It is an exercise in observation, in opening eyes and ears and taking in what is special about where you are. So that's my kind of starting point for what I want to talk about in terms of field work and this notion of inquiry. And I want to try and pose this question to you. What is our, what is your locality like? And I want to share with you five free approaches to developing place knowledge. So in the Ofsted Research Review, field work has its own section, but its importance is really spread throughout. And in the research review, the Geographical Association is cited in terms of the website, and it talks about concepts in geography, first-hand geographical concepts, going out and about and finding those spatial patterns, finding out how people, how places and environments are organised on Earth from a very local level. Because taught well, Ofsted say in the research review, spatial thinking develops a meaningful sense of place and appreciation of the interconnectedness of the world and of the subject. So it talks in the research review about thinking like a geographer, and that's what we're going to be exemplifying today, wherever we can. And, and what we need to do is think about what those case studies are. What are those stories of locality, stories of what's near you, that you're going to be telling the children? And sometimes you need to think about your own stories and what those stories are, so you can share those with the children, as well as, and in the case studies we're going to see, you're going to be hearing about the stories that the children are coming up with as well. So all the time we're trying to develop the connections between the geographical processes, and that might be a scary concept for you, and we can certainly talk about what the processes might be locally in the Q&A, between the processes and the location, because then when you start to talk about those, a lot becomes revealed that might well be hidden. And as Ofsted say, the more they go out there, pupils remember more of what's been taught. So, so what I'm going to try and talk about in these five top ideas, five free things that you can do, is to try and show you there's an interplay here to try and unlock the geography, that's what the key is all about, to try and unlock the geography, you need to find the interplay between the human and the physical in the location. And that's how you develop the place knowledge. Because what Ofsted say is that field work is vital to geographical practice. That's why we chose to focus on it um, in today's session. But in Key Stage 2 classrooms, in the schools that they looked at in the blog recently, um, it, it was weak. But this is not to say that schools weren't going out there, but when they did, they did not make the observations or collect the data that's already been talked about that they could then analyze and present, and we would say, for a purpose. So the first approach, here's the first approach. Do you know? Do you care? Who could we ask about our locality? Who looks after the locations that we go to? Who doesn't? What's near or far? Why is it like this? Many, many questions that you could ask. I'm sure you could add to those in the chat as well. But, but sometimes you want to formalise these. You want to say, well, how does this lead into a six week unit of, unit of work? And this is where we come back to this idea of inquiry, posing questions. Now, certainly in the Ofsted <coughs> Research Review, it does talk about the pedagogy of inquiry and the actual process of inquiry. And those might be two different things. You might want to think about that. And again, we can perhaps talk about that in the in the chat. Um, so what we're trying to do in these inquiries, these these questions that we're asking about the localities that we're in through the field work, is we're trying to process and connect the knowledge that you might have. So the locational knowledge, the bits of information, we're trying to connect all these, these together. And these seven questions that you can see on the screen are similar to that um, 
circle that you saw earlier on, the Paul Rowan circle that Julia Tanner just showed earlier on. And, and, and sometimes you just need a starting point. And these questions might well help you if you're trying to develop these inquiries. So this is the first kind of top tip. The first question is, what is this place? Where is this place? How, how is this place similar to or different from another place? What is the place like? Why is the place as it is? How is the place connected to other places? How is the place changing? And how would it feel like to live in this place? So I'm not gonna dwell on these questions. You can scribble them down. You can watch the video afterwards. You can take a screenshot, but just think, are, are your local area studies answering um, and thinking about questions, questions like this? So the second approach is doing this idea of noticing and observing. And I'd really encourage you when you get the slides after this is to look on this BBC Hard Talk half hour um, interview with Chris Packham, the naturalist, the links on the screen. What he says is during lockdown, he really realised, even though his job is to notice, he really noticed in a small patch of woodland in an area near him, he started to look and hear and understand in different ways. He started to look rather than just see, hear rather than just listen, understand, not just read or label. So not just have words for things. Okay, you can say the word oak tree, um, but what is an oak tree like? How does it interact with the environment that it's near? Does it dominate? Um, and he comes up with all these other wonderful things that just tumble out of his mouth. He talks about being comfortable with localities. Not all your children may be comfortable. He talks about the fact that he notices subtle nuances about the landscape and about the environment. The changes that occur, the length of the day, the length of the shadows, the sounds. What are the different species? This should be something that you experience regularly, possibly even daily. Noticing the process of growth. We all noticed this in lockdown, didn't we? There are opportunities here. There are affordances. There are all sorts of other words there that you can pick out and read, read for yourself. But the second approach is to really go out there yourself, do a staff meeting, go and notice and ob observe. Because as again, Ofsted say, through observing, collecting data for themselves, analyzing and describing the findings, People learn how to observe and record the environment around them. In effect, they've been immersed in relevant thinking. And so geographical knowledge sticks in their memory. That's what we're aiming to do. So the third approach is about finding some resources, finding some images, finding some photographs. And this is where we start to think about the idea in geography of graphicacy, looking at images of localities. This is a locality near me. I can see it from my window. And this locality has changed. There's a school um, just out of shot here. And I'd want to show this, and I have shown this to children near here, because what's bizarre about this is this is 1984. Um, and it's very different now if you walk down this street, but not different in a way that you'd imagine, because people imagine I live in London. It's grown up. It's got bigger. There's been tower blocks put in place. But actually, this is what the locality looks like now. The tower blocks have disappeared. There's a story here. There's, there's, there's a sense of place that's very much changed from those monolithic 1960s tower blocks, which there were decisions made that took them away. So Ofsted talk about finding these graphical or visual forms of representation, because sometimes the sense of place is more effective than just writing about it or telling somebody about it. So here you start to see patterns. Sometimes places grow, sometimes places shrink, and they change in all sorts of different ways. Fourth approach I want to share with you, four to five, is to look on the Geographical Association website for some of the case studies and the storifying, if you like, of place that you might well have uh, an opportunity to find out about. There are two links on here. One wonderful one from Jonathan Kersey in Southborough Primary School, where he creates a video with his group of children and he tells the true story of Little Red Riding Hood, a geographical adventure. He links it in with his literacy work in year two. And it's a wonderful video where you get this Little Red Riding Hood going through localities, looking at map work and trying to avoid the big good wolf because the big good wolf is trying to do lots of interesting things and trying to get her out of trouble. So that's a really good case study. Bottom case study is one from my own practice in schools with years three and five. And we asked the inquiry question, what do we feel about the environment around our school? Um, what is it like? Trying to think about the people's everyday geography. So this is again, tapping into this geographical idea in the Austin Research Review about observing collecting data in all sorts of different ways and analyzing and presenting. In these two examples, presenting it through a short video or a sequence of photographs, a bit like I've 
suggested. But the very final one, perhaps the big winning one that you want to look into, which is free, which is from a government body called Natural England. And there's these things called Natural England character profiles. You'd not find these um, unless you were looking for them. And what these are, are where you're trying to put your local area knowledge into a bigger picture, into a context. So maybe you live in the Northwest and you want to know what is the Northwest like? What is the geography of the Northwest? Who's going to tell you? Well, these character profiles will tell you. And there's all sorts of different PDFs you can download here. And you can see some of the high quality text, the vocabulary that you can see, can see there. And, and again, ignore all the text on here, but basically what these documents are telling you is, what is this landscape like through time? What is it like today? What are the key habitats and the species? Um, what can people do there? What's the recreation and access? So the quality of this, because it's from a government agency, is so much better than from Wikipedia, I'd argue. Uh, what's the settlement patterns like? What are the habitats there? Who owns the land? So a whole range of different perspectives there that you can look into. So those are my five top tips, really. Um, I'll be around for the Q&A and look forward to interacting with you shortly. So I'm going to pass over now to Sophie. Sophie. Um, it's nice to be here today talking to everyone. A little bit of context about who I am. I'm a Key Stage 2 teacher. I'm a Year 6 teacher in a junior school. Um, I'm going to share with you two fieldwork um, case studies which my Year 6 class have done this year. Um, it's a three form entry junior school, so they've been done across three classes. And I'm sharing these case studies in response to these two quotes, which you can see on screen now, which have already been mentioned by Julia and Anthony about um, fieldwork and how, um, particularly, how you can use fieldwork work to collect data, analyze, present findings and, and have that audience. Uh, next screen, please. And again, this you've already seen as well, but I just want to draw your attention back to it because what I'm going to try and exemplify now is how you can use this inquiry process in your own planning when you're planning this kind of field work, but actually also how you can use it with the children and um, encourage the children to plan their own field work. So I'm going to be sharing two case studies. One is what I'm going to call a teacher led inquiry where I posed the question and guided the children very much through the inquiry process and one where I handed over over to the children and I was still there to facilitate and provide support but the children came up with their own questions and took themselves through the inquiry process a lot more. Next slide please. So the first um, field work I'm going to share with you is the teacher guided inquiry so this is the one where I used the inquiry circle with my own planning and the question I posed was what type of land use do you expect to find at the quadrant and what type of shop would you open at the quadrant and why um, the quadrant is like the little shopping um, this part very close to our school it's about half a mile away from our school um, next slide please And a little bit of context, this field work um, and this question was posed at the end of a year six unit on global trade. So the children, I'm just going to look into the book now, they'd learned about the history of trade, how it became global. Um, they'd learned about food imports from around the world. They'd learned about global supply chains, primary, secondary and tertiary. And um, they'd understood inequality in the global supply chain. They had learned about fair trade. Um, and then at the very end of the unit, they then began to look at what trade was like in their local area. And this is the field work that we did. So the very first thing they did after I gave them the question um, was they began to predict what land use types they would find in the local area. They were familiar with the five key land use types because they learned those in year four. So we recapped what they were um, and the children decided that they would be very likely to find um, transport in the form of a car park, um, that they were going to find commercial in the forms of the shops and residential above the shops because they know that there were flats above the shops. And they, they knew this already because they're all mostly, when I asked them, they had all been to the quadrant. Um, we did have to do this field work first virtually this year because we were in lockdown. So then we, we visited the quadrant virtually um, through Google Earth. When we arrived at the quadrant on Google Earth, the children um, had talked about in the class beforehand the different types of commercial shops they might find at the quadrant. And you can see here on the tally chart, they'd listed and color coded the shops. As they then went round the quadrant, they had the map, which you can see on the screen, which was printed from Digimaps for Schools, which is a fantastic resource that I really do recommend if you don't have it already. Um, and they went and looked at the shop and they decided what type of commercial property that was, and they recorded it onto their map. Um, this is one example. Some children then took this 
further because they finished and they began to widen um, out of the area and began to look at other land, uh, other land uses around a wider area of the quadrant as well. Um, next slide, please. When we got back to the classroom or left Google Earth in the classroom and moved ourselves off our iPads, the children then um, analysed that data into a bar graph. And you can see one of the bar graphs which the children drew on the screen now. Um, and then we had a class discussion about what they found out. Um, we actually had a class discussion about how they knew Google Earth was slightly out of date because there were some vacant properties which weren't um, pictured on the Google Earth, which they were talking about how often is Google Earth updated and we had loads of conversations about that. Um, and then eventually they decided what shop they would open at the quadrant and why, which drew out some really interesting discussions. Um, and it really showed the children who were thinking about what shop they would go to. And some children were beginning to think about what shops the wider community would want to go to. Um, some of the children were thinking about what other people um, might be doing in the quadrant. So when they go here, they would step out of the church. And when they step out of the church, they might want to get a coffee. I remember one of the children having that discussion. So they, it brought out some absolutely fantastic discussion. And um, we did this one in the spring term. Uh, next slide, please. So after they'd been through that inquiry circle, very much led with me and I'd guided them through the step of each step, the children then in the summer term um, went on to their own um, field work, which was at the end of a unit on sustainability. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll give you the context of where the field work came in the unit again. Um, the children had done a unit on sustainability. They'd learned about the consumption of resources. They'd learned about the definition of sustainability. Um, they'd considered um, if they thought themselves were sustainable, they'd analyzed their carbon footprints. They'd learned um, renewable and non-renewable energy resources and thought about what would happen if a PowerPoint opened, a PowerPoint, a power plant opened in their um, local area on some green space near the school. They'd learned about climate change, um, greenhouse gas emissions, and then done a debate on um, different people's perceptions from around the world on climate change. Um, and then then after they developed this big bank of knowledge of um, sustainability and what it's like in the world, we then drew that into our local community, our school community. Um, and we looked at the inquiry circle as a class and we started thinking, what questions could we ask about sustainability in our school? So I gave them the question frame to support them generating their questions. Um, and they spent a lot of time discussing and coming up with different questions. And you can see some of the questions some of my children came up with um, on the screen at the moment. We also had a big discussion about which would make good inquiry questions, which questions could we, what data could we show for each question. So the children had had a lot of discussion to help them decide on their questions before we, we actually picked the fieldwork questions. Next slide please. Once we had um, generated our questions, um, we did that, the children did that in there with their learning partners. Um, the children were put into groups of three and they had to choose a question to focus on. Um, I gave them a little bit of support with this in terms of what do I want to see their field work um, turn into. So I said that I wanted to see them collect some data and I wanted to see them present it in some way, ideally with a map or um, with a chart or graph. And then the children planned their field work. So what you can see on the screen now is um, a child's field work plan. They had to think about what data would they collect, um, their question, what data would they collect, how would they collect it, what equipment they would need, what their graph might look like at the end. And then I collected that in, gave some feedback where needed and some facilitation, and then they had to go out and do their field work. Um, so this child you're seeing at the moment collected it on a tally chart. She did a bit of, um, in their group, they did a bit of um, iPad work to find out about um, how recyclable the litter was they were finding on the school grounds. Um, and then at the end, when they'd collected all their data, they then presented it. Um, so you've also got the poster. This child decided that they wanted to put posters around the school. Uh, I think one child did a poster and one child wrote a letter to the head teacher and you've got the poster on screen. Uh, what I really want to share though is how different children took it in so many different ways because they had the freedom to do this. So I'm gonna very, very quickly, if we go on to the next slide, show you another group's work so you've got the field work plan on the left hand side you've got their 
bar draft. They then presented their data on a map. They collected photographs of different trees. And um, they had a um, tree identification sheet so they could go and identify the trees in the environmental area. They plotted the location of the trees on the map. And then they wrote a letter to the head teacher asking for more biodiversity in the school grounds, wanting more trees and why the trees, a greater bio, um, diversity of trees would benefit our school. And then I've got one more example from another class just to show you how that was then replicated in different ways across year six. Um, this was a group in the other class, they did litter as well, but it was presented in a really different way. So you've got their plan, they actually planned where they were going to collect their litter out on a little map here. So you can see the little aerial image and sketch map. They've then collected their data. They've decided a very different bar chart and way of representing their data. Um, and they, they looked at, um, litter in terms of is it plastic litter, paper litter, tin litter or crisp packet litter and at the end they wrote a letter to the head teacher asking for more bins for, for the school playground and that's how they interpreted the field work um, and across year six we had so many different interpretations of that and the children took it in so many different ways and it was absolutely fantastic and um, so yeah that's what I have to share and I hope it is helpful, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that, Sophie. I know I'm going to be taking those to my year six teachers, I have to say. Um, so, uh, I'm Jen Lomas. I'm currently a year four teacher um, in a three form entry primary school, um, and I'm also geography lead. So I've actually worked with year two to get some local area field work going right now. So what you're seeing is actually from last week, so they haven't quite finished it yet. Um, so, here we've got is a bit of context. Uh, so in the summer term one, they were learning about Africa as a continent, including the location, country names, key physical and human features, where they made some landmark maps, looking at climate and weather. And their big question was, does it snow in Africa that they've looked at? And then this term, um, we're going down smaller, so they're learning about Kenya, and then they're comparing it with their local area. Um, so they're locating Kenya. Um, you can see on the screen a bit of pre-teaching of vocabulary, which is really important at our school. Um, they've compared their daily life to that of a child in a Kenyan town or city, because we live in an urban area. And they've compared aerial photos of urban areas in Kenya and England, focusing on settlements and housing, um, which actually links into a year three topic, which will help them, hopefully. Um, and there you can see, um, having a look at um, the vocabulary and thinking about how children live um, in Kenya and what they what they are expecting, what they're predicting so that teachers can see what misconceptions they might have to address. Um, next slide, please. So um, for their field work, um, the children actually generated their own questions. So it was part child led, part teacher led. Um, so they have explored their local area on Digimaps to begin with, and they're asking children, you know, what do you think we could find out about Whitley by going on a local walk um, around our local area? And then they generated their own questions, such as what type of houses are in Whitley? What are the human features? What are the physical features? What sort of transport is there? Are there any shops? Because um, they've been really looking at comparing um, a similar urban area in Kenya with their area in Whitley. So we really want them to get the feel for what we actually mean by, you know, the urban area in Whitley and their local area. Um, next slide, please. Could I just interject? Uh, if anybody's not muted other than Jen, would you mind just muting yourself? I can't quite see who, who that is. That would be really appreciated. Uh, thanks, Jen. Um, so um, after generating their questions and thinking, you know, what are we going to do on this field work? Um, they went out last week when it stopped raining, <laughs> thankfully, and uh, they took photos of lots of physical features, lots of human features um, and anything that kind of helped them um, answer their questions. It was um, done a little bit differently because we have three classes, but all focusing on physical and human and looking at types of houses and shops um, specifically. And then they came back to class and they sorted their human and physical features as a class, as you can see here, that was then um, replicated there. So these were photos that children had actually taken um, and then yet yeah, they sorted them in groups, I think, when they came back to the class. 
Um, and then the next slide, please. Um, they also looked at all the data they collected. So some had done tally charts, some had drawn little sketch maps, some had just made notes, some had taken photos. It was very much up to the children and also what the teachers and I thought they could manage. <laughs> and their main questions they wanted to answer, they looked at what physical features did they see, what types of houses, and apparently they were, they were feeling super clever that they were learning detached houses, semi-detached. They know Tudor houses because they've done that um, previously with the Great Fire of London, so linking it all in with prior learning, terraced houses, um, human features, and then they're all really interested in what kind of shops there are, especially, you know, the ones they always go to, like the fish and chip shop. And there was a big discussion about who goes to Aldi, who goes to Morrison's. Oh, I didn't know that, you know, my mum works in Morrison's. Um, and there's lots of lovely discussions you get um, that come out with the children. And then, um, next slide, please. And then some children decided to write notes about what they found out. So those children that are more confident with writing in year two, um, as you can see, wrote some really interesting um, things. Some children were looking more at the flowers, some at the different types of houses, some at the shops. Um, other children didn't choose to do that, which is absolutely fine. Um, and they maybe did some, uh, drew some sketch maps or drew some pictures. Um, and then this is where we're up to now. So the end point, hopefully, um, on the next slide, please. Um, they will eventually be creating a messy map. So almost like a model map of either, um, so they're gonna be in groups. So some will do an urban settlement, some will do rural, and they'll either do a Kenyan one or one in Reading uh, where we are. So they're now going to go on a virtual field trip via Google Earth to a comparable area in Kenya. Um, and that's not because of COVID, that's just because we're not taking a load of nine-year-olds to Kenya. Um, and then they're going to be looking for similarities and differences um, and comparing the two. So are there similar settlement shapes? So if you look at lots of different villages in Kenya, lots of different villages in the UK, um, transport routes, the materials used for building, lots of different things. Um, to be comparing and then um, making it like a, I don't wanna say stereotypical, but for learning from what they've learned with their patterns that they've seen, um, designing what they think would be a good um, urban area or rural area for Kenya and for Reading. Um, and just there a little note that said that the discussions that came out of the field work, um, the number five and six buses went past. So then and that class then went on a huge look of transport routes and oh which bus do you get on to go to the shops oh I get on and loads of lovely discussions about how we're you know interconnected with other areas not just a very small local area there was about road signs um shops that there were there shops that they wanted there different parks the fact we have a swimming pool a church all the facilities that are in your local area loads of different discussions came out um and I know um my teachers are um very excited to go you know, off um, in a bit of a different way to then come back together to do their messy maps at the end. Um, and they're all going to compare because we've got three classes. They're all going to be comparing if they all came up with the same ideas, if they came up with different ideas and why, and doing lots of discussion around that. And that was a very quick whistle stop tour around my <laughs> current year two's fantastic uh, field work in the local area. Um, I thought it was really interesting, sorry, that we came in um, via the topic, if you were, of Africa. So you don't always have to come in from looking at your local area. Um, you know, you can make it link with other things and wider things if you want. Uh, but yes, that is it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jen. Uh, and thank you to everybody who has um, given their speeches. I think it's always really fascinating to hear about what people are are doing not only the ideas but also to hear the the case studies from uh from actual examples from school as well i think that's been really helpful so thank you ever so much for, for our, our speak, speakers this evening um steve you've been monitoring the chat so is there any i know i've seen that there's been a lot of comments coming through are there any key questions that have been coming through I think it's really good that uh, so many people are beginning to share ideas that that for field work that they're using. That's that's coming across really, really nicely, and people are sort of making connections with each other, which I think is great to see. Um, a couple of things have come up, which I think 
we could ask the speakers about. Um, one is for cross-curricular learning field work, it's not just science. Does anybody want to make a comment about cross-curricular that's not just science? I think the, the link with science is a really useful one, but how can you link with other subjects? What else has been done? Uh, Julie, your hands up. Yeah. Well, um, I would say that there are lots of fantastic links um, with history, going and exploring change in the local area and uh, looking at uh, the geography of historical sites that children might visit as part of their history study. Uh, and of course, I would, I would also emphasize that all field work involves loads of opportunities for um, really purposeful literacy work and really purposeful mathematical work. Um, so I could I could give more. Do you want some examples, Steve? Just a couple of examples would be really nice, Julie, if you've got yeah. them. OK, well, uh, I think if you think about um, children doing field work and having real audiences, then there are umpteen different ways that they can communicate um, with their real audience. So if, for example, um, they're uh, thinking about litter and how it can be reduced in the local park, they can communicate with real, real audiences, maybe uh, people who use the park by putting up posters, running uh, maybe a campaign through their uh, school parent teacher association. They can, um, they can contact the local authority to talk about what could be done to reduce litter in the park. So they could write letters. Um, they could collect data that they could present uh, to them in terms of bar charts or graphs. Uh, they could actually uh, interview people, collect survey data about what people think about litter in the park and what pe ideas people have about how that could be reduced. So I think, uh, you know, there are any any inquiry you take that's got a real purpose with a real audience. Um, there are many, many opportunities uh, always for language work and very often for doing data handling collection as well. That's brilliant. Thank you, Julia. Sophie? Um, I was just going to say the history is always a good way. Um, I, I'm going to mention Digimaps again, but there's some really great stuff on Digimaps and you can get historic maps. So you might not have your own access to um, historic maps, but if you do go on Digimaps, you can. And there used to be a website called Map My Walk, and I'll try and find the link and pop it in if it's still, I know, I'm not sure if it's still there or not, but I'll try and find it. But again, you could get historical maps on there and you can compare how land use has changed over time. Um, and that's always really a good basis for, for inquiry within a historical link. Sharon, did you want to come yeah, in? Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, I think there's so many possibilities, as Julia hinted, for links to, to English and literacy and uh, uh, so many opportunities to perhaps take a more um, uh, lyrical approach to your field work as well. So possibilities for po po poems like haikus uh, or recipes of a place to get a, a sense of, of place going uh, and to get the children to appreciate um, the senses. Um, so lots, lots of possibilities. They say that geography is the story of people and place. So, so many possibilities for stories, talking to people, ga gathering in the stories of place as a form of inquiry. So I hope that helps. Jen, and then I'll move on to the next question. Um, it's just come to me now. Our year ones, uh, when they do the, like a, almost a transition topic, um, when they first come into year one, do um, like an all about me, be the best I can be kind of topic. And actually, they're going to do some very local area field work looking at the school and about how they make, can make an area of the school the best it can be. So it's actually some PSHE you can link in there as well. So they go around the school, emotion map it, where you're like, oh, this place is red because it makes you feel angry or it's smelly, usually the toilets, um, you know, this place is green. And then they look at why a place that they all picked as green, everyone loves, and why they picked, you know, a place that most people have put red. Um, you know, why, why do we feel that way about it? How does it make us feel? And then actually, well, let's look at how we can improve it. Um, so there's really nice PSHE links there as well. Okay. Um, before I do the next question, can I just pick up on a comment that Jess Hills just made, which I just think is absolutely brilliant, which is get the children to lead the teachers around the area. I think that's absolutely fabulous, particularly when you get a situation where the teachers don't live in the area, so they don't know what the local area is like. Getting the children to lead the teachers around 
Fabulous. Love that idea. Um, another one, if uh, a panel could sort of um, try to address it, is how do you differentiate for different abilities on field work? Anybody want to have a crack at that one? Kate? Uh, thinking, I'm um, thinking more about children who might have visual impairment or hearing impairment. Um, a lot of the time when we go and do some place profiling, we might say, um, close your eyes and listen to, to what's there. And I think doing that in different ways, because if you do have children who have sensory impairments, you do need to be aware of different ways that you're accessing it. I also think if you've got children who've got um, physical challenges, you need to just be, maybe walk the route that you're going before you go to make sure everything is accessible. I think unless you are conscious of that, sometimes some of those challenging aren't that obvious unless you're going out and you're looking at those opportunities. Uh, and maybe getting children who do use different senses uh, to lead some aspects as well. So if a child focuses more on their hearing than their sight, can they lead something that they have noticed as well? So I think it's, it's getting a whole range of different opportunities for children in that way as well. Jen? Um, often the children will actually surprise you as well. Um, so I would say don't limit them too much. Um, so some of my best maps have come from my children that you know aren't the best at writing or um but also if you're doing lots of different data collections some children might need to take photos some are doing a tally chart you know some are doing drawings pitch um and again the child led is fantastic as well because they actually tell you what they're comfortable with looking at and tell you what they're comfortable with doing themselves um but don't don't go off what they're like in reading, writing and maths, I would always say, because um, I know it's really easy to do that. But actually, usually those children that aren't the most engaged in their les those lessons just love the job field work and they come out with the most insightful stuff you've ever heard. And it's just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Jim. Totally agree. Anthony, did you want to? Coming just now. to echo that, that grouping thing is so important, certainly in the case study that I've just put in the chat that I mentioned in my session talk. Um, point four, the example that I showed, I really learned through that by putting them into different groups, different friendship groups, non kind of literacy focused, mathematics focused attainment groups is, is really key. And, and trying to, if you can, send them out in small groups so the quality of the talk can occur. It's that that is really valuable and the repeated visits that's really valuable. That's where you meet the needs of a range of attainers. But I appreciate given adults, given ratios and things like that, it's not always possible. That's why doing it from your school gates, even just sending them out with a TA or going out yourself and allowing your TA to be with your class, I think is a really key thing. Sophie? Um, I was just going to build on what everyone's been saying, but I have found the children working in trios works really well. Um, as it gives more support. So that peer support works really well. Um, and then the children have different ideas. So in the field work examples I shared, the children shared ideas. Um, and actually, surprisingly, some of the children I might not have said were necessarily the children I think would be coming up with the ideas were coming up with the ideas and helping the other children in the group um, also just having different ways to record so I shared some letters but not all children recorded but through letters some children made um, for example some children did energy and they made little covers to go around the edges of light switches and they communicated in a in a non-written way through posters and um, some of my children helped record an assembly with me on litter to the whole school and um, that was another way they communicated they decided they wanted to share with school so we did a powerpoint assembly together in class and I supported with that some of the children typed their letters instead of hand wrote them um, to support them there because I don't know about your classes but my classes typing has improved so much over remote learning so some of them were more confident with that um, and some took photographs um, and recorded through photographs instead and um, so it is um it's giving them that range of approaches and being there to scaffold and support through discussion when needed, having the vocabulary up around them, maybe giving speaking frames um, to support with the analysis if they need speaking frames or sentence openers. Um, but there's so many different ways you can you can do that. So, yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Steve, I think we've got about time for one more question because we're 
getting up to six o'clock. Just there's been quite a number of questions about progression. I don't know whether Julia wants to say anything more about progression. You started off with that really and, and developed that well. Do you want to say anything else on progression, Julia? Um, well, the, the GA does have the Geographic Association does have a progression document you can download uh, if you want to look at that. But if you if, and that's about progression across um, knowledge and understanding and skills. But if you're particularly interested in progression in field work, then I think I would recommend the the, the framework that's published in the recent geograph um, in the recent primary geography at spring uh, it, it's really too detailed to say much more about it now but it does break it down into four age groups and does suggest techniques that specific techniques that all children should have a chance to experience in each of those four age range so uh, uh, the feedback that we've had about it has been very positive people do seem to have found it useful thanks julia okay, okay. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, everybody. Um, it's coming up to six o'clock, so we need to uh, start, start wrapping this up. Uh, so thank you very much for attending. We hope that you found it a really supportive, uh, enjoyable, informative uh, session. Uh, there's been lots of talk in the chat. It will be, this uh, event will be, well, it has been recorded and will be going onto YouTube so you can catch up with any parts that you want to rewatch or if you came in slightly later you can watch the bits that you didn't see uh, via YouTube and the first uh, event is there as well. Um, Anthony did you want to? Thanks so just to say that there's a survey in the chat we'd really appreciate you completing that to give us more inspiration for what we might do in future um, occasions when we have Jog Live 3. Jog Live 3 um, content to be decided but it will be Wednesday September the 1st so put that in your diaries but just a reminder that there is free primary membership of the Geographical Association you may want to uh, google that it's a very easily accessible link but then there's also primary plus membership which gives you access to all these um, journal articles from 2004 onwards and gives you the discounts as well and you can join online as you can see there so just a reminder Wednesday the 1st at 5 is the next one if you could complete the survey, um, but tweet us at EYPPC underscore GA. We'd love to chat to you further. And otherwise I will say thank you very much for being here and good night. <laughs>